Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do. To educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only to learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to today's show. I have a very special guest, someone who's actually been um, a friend of mine online for quite some time, but this is actually the first time you and I, Christine, get to meet face to face. Uh, Many of you probably heard of Christine Hassler. She is um, an incredibly gifted coach, especially in the space of relationships and helping all of us sort of see our patterns in relationships and see how our internal world is sort of a reflection of our outer world and the people we call in. And so I wanted to have her on this podcast, one, because I adore her and we haven't gotten a chance to do this yet uh, officially. So that's part of it. But also because this podcast is all about being our next level selves, getting better, growing ourselves so that we can evolve the world. And someone like Christine, I think, um, speaks to this um, idea of bettering ourselves so that we can call in, uh, you know, an amazing life for ourselves. So Christine, welcome to the show. I'm super excited to have you. Oh, I'm so happy. And as you were talking, I was thinking of the time you and I went on the phone, got on the phone, I was dealing with some health stuff and you just gave me your time. You gave me your energy and information. It was just so helpful. And I'm so grateful for that. You really do walk the talk and you're here to serve. And I just respect you so much. Uh, Well, I appreciate that so much. Ditto. Let's jump into this really quick, because I know um, that we are in a really interesting and difficult uh, time, right? So um, obviously, a lot of us have been struggling um, just in general because of COVID and all the things that have happened around that. And um, one of the things that I have been getting, I'm sure you've been getting, is lots and lots of people who are starting relationships, ending relationships, struggling in relationships. And when I think about um, our lives as humans, I really see it as four major jobs that all of us have to do. We have to manage finance. We have to manage health and fitness. We must be able to connect and develop relationships. And romantic relationships, in my mind, are the most uh, impactful, perhaps the most important. And then finally, um, we need to uh, you know, really develop purpose and meaning. And so the first question for you from me is how do when let, let's talk a little bit about this idea, because I do think it's out there in the self-development space in a sense, but I do think people kind of get it wrong a lot of times. And I want to just have you explain to people what we mean when we say our internal way of showing up and being in the world is going to call in or going to create what is outside of us in terms of the relationships that we will have with people. What exactly um, does this mean and how do we begin playing with this idea? Yeah, well, that's a big question. So we'll we'll, we'll break it down as, as much as we can. I love that question. I love big questions. So when we, well, first let's start with the iceberg theory. I'm sure a lot of you have thought this, you know, with an iceberg, you can only see about three to 5% of it above the water. The rest is below the water and remains unseen. And we can think of our conscious and our subconscious mind like that. So our conscious mind really only governs three to 5% of our feelings, behaviors, reactions, choices, decisions, and our subconscious, everything below the surface, really rules about 95 to 97% of our actions, behaviors, so on and so forth. So When we talk about our internal world, we can't just talk about the mood we may be in or the kind of issues we're aware of or the beliefs that we're running that we're aware of. We also have to look at that 95% that's completely subconscious. 
And it's doing personal development work, whether it's therapy or coaching or, or however people pursue their personal development that lowers the water so that more that's in the subconscious becomes conscious. Because so much of our adult life is programmed and patterned by our childhood. Really up to seven, then another marker is 12, another marker is 18. But by the time we're 25, we're pretty much, pretty much got our programming and patterning. And yes, things can happen after that that impact us, of course, but those things that impact us are gonna impact us in similar ways that our childhood impacted us. So a lot of lowering the surface of the water and bringing the subconscious to the conscious is doing work in our past. And that doesn't mean we have to go and relive traumatic memories. I never, never teach that. I never advise people to go back into their trauma and relive it. But it does mean doing some things like inner child work, healing of memories. We can talk about that and we can break it down more so that we're not just unconscious, sub unconsciously reacting to things and choosing things that really aren't in alignment with what we want. So let me give you an example from my life. So one of the things that I went through as a child is I, I was very bullied and teased. Um, and it was kind of girl bullying. It was more with words than physical actions. I didn't get beat up or anything like that, but I'm sure a lot of the women listening can relate to the mean girls concept. And I went from being a pretty confident, socially, you know, felt like socially I fit in kid thinking nothing was really wrong with me to being told a lot of things about myself. Yeah, I hate Christine Club started being ostracized. And so what that did to me internally is it formed a lot of beliefs of I'm not enough. I don't fit in. I'm less than there's something wrong with me. And whenever we go through something like that as a child or a young adult, whenever we feel less than. In, in any way, shape or form, or we feel unsafe, or we just feel like it's, we're, not, we're not heard and seen and it's not okay to be ourselves, we have to come up with, I, with what I call a compensatory strategy. So since I felt so less than here, a survival skill was like, well, how do I come up with a way to feel more than? And so, or fit in or be validated. So examples, maybe people pleasing, you know, like, okay, you know, I, I, I don't feel like safe in my home. So I people please to give me a sense of safety because if I make people happy, then like things will be okay. So my compensatory strategy was actually overachieving. It's like if I don't fit in, then I'm just going to be very successful. I'm going to get straight A's. The teachers are going to like me. If I'm nothing socially, I have no friends. At least I have that. So that became my addiction in so many ways, just achieving and achieving and achieving. And I reached a pretty great level of success by the time I was 25. But what was really driving me was this massive internal insecurity, right? Massive internal insecurity. So if I'm driven internally by massive insecurity, yes, I may be successful, but do you think I'm gonna be successful and choose things that are really in alignment with who I am? Or is that subconscious programming of I'm not enough, I don't fit in, I have to compensate going to drive me and I'm gonna attract external results that are me attempting to fill that void, but aren't really what I want. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, it makes sense. So it sounds like when you, you put these compensatory mechanisms in place, you might have found success, but you know, you may right. not, some of those same things may not help you find love or may not be uh, valuable in other areas of your life. So while you're compensating in one area, you right. may suffer in other areas. Right. And it's all, it's all the, what, what you haven't cleaned up inside. So since I hadn't cleaned up that insecurity, I was constantly looking for things to fill that void, be it the job, be it the relationship, whatever it is. A lot of people are in relationships that basically are like their parents. So another example is, you know, inside, like I never had father's approval. This is not my story. This is, I'm thinking of many clients I've worked with, because that's a very big father wound, not feeling like dad was ever proud of you not feeling like he was patient for you, not feeling like he was emotionally available. This is for, for men and women. And what ends up happening is you end up being very attracted to emotionally unavailable people who you never feel enough for. So again, even though externally you could be like, I wanna date someone totally differently and I wanna have a different marriage than my parents did. And you, you may externally, again, above the iceberg consciously want that. But if subconsciously and internally, there's still a little one inside 
who is looking for dad's approval, you're subconsciously going to attract someone like dad. And it doesn't matter, male, female, someone like dad, who you're going to try to get that approval from. So then you find yourself in a relationship where you feel emotionally distant. You feel like no matter what you do, it's not enough. Maybe they're a bit avoidant. And you're like, how did I get here? This isn't what I wanted. But again, it's that internal unresolved stuff that draws those experiences in. Yeah, actually, um, it's funny, Christine, I'll tell you, I'll tell you and everybody listening a little story about my background, too. So my mother um, growing up was an incredibly loving mom. She had four kids by the time she was 28. She also had her own mother traumas. And so while she was incredibly loving with us, she was also incredibly emotionally volatile a lot of times. You never knew what you were really going to get with my mom. Sometimes she was overwhelmed and crying. Sometimes she was angry. Other times she was like, throwing you know like jello on the floor we were all rolling around in it laughing and playing and so I grew up not necessarily knowing um, what I was going to get from my mom that made me a little bit uh, untrusting emotionally of women and it also made me my compensatory reaction was okay I won't ask anything of myself I'll just try to keep everything okay for everyone else. And so in all of my female relationships, what I would do is either one, be emotionally avoidant. So, you know, kind of be a little stiff arm and expect there to be emotional volatility and, or just take it all on and never ask anything emotionally from myself. And so what then ended up happening is that's not a sustainable way of being. And so a lot of my relationships blew up as a result of this. And so I have this same experience and like you have seen many many people repeat these patterns here's one thing I want to to see what you think about this because one of the things that I have seen is that in life it almost seems like we get certain things again and again and again it's almost like sometimes like Christy sometimes I think we're like in a video game like we're playing like some some simulation <laughs> where level, it, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah right it's like it's like we're in this video game almost and you keep getting the same things again and again you have to beat that big boss until you can go on to the next level and one of the things I've always told myself I got to a point where I was like if this keeps happening then it's me and then I was confused because I was like but if it's me what exactly am I doing and you alluded to something and I, I want to ask you about this it's like this childhood, uh, you know, um, wounding or inner child work, part of me spotting these patterns in myself, the first step was, okay, I know it's me, but what am I doing? And I realized I was telling some kind of story. I just didn't realize what the story was. And it sounds like what you're saying is a lot of these stories are coming from, you know, age seven, age 12, age 18, like they're coming from these formative years and we don't know they're there because to use your analogy the iceberg we can't see underneath that so am i getting this correct and how would you begin to help us understand how to spot these patterns one and then number two look for these underlying stories mm -hmm. like what does it really mean to go back and spot these stories and take care of our inner child mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great question so the last book i wrote is called expectation hangover and it's basically a book about leveraging disappointment. An expectation hangover is when things don't go as planned. They go as planned, but you don't think, you don't feel like you thought you would. You finally get the great job, but you don't, it didn't make you feel confident and happy. Or life just throws you an unexpected curveball. And kind of what you're talking about, the same thing, repeating, feeling like I'm on the same level of video game and I can't get out of is like expectation hangover after expectation hangover. And it's like, oh no, not this again. How am I in this again? And the reason I wrote the book was it's not about managing expectations because good luck with that as a human being, as a human, you're going to have expectations. It's about learning how to deal with the disappointment when it happens and leverage it and really learn from it rather than just try to get through it, be strong or just work or push through or spiritual bypass by everything happens for a reason, but you don't bother like investigating what the reason is. You're just like, yeah, okay. whatever. and then the same thing continues to happen. So from my perspective, the purpose that we all have on this planet is to evolve our soul, evolve our consciousness, to move more and more out of fear and more and more into love, to move more and more out of separation, which man, are we seeing that broadcasted for us in the outdoor world big time, and more and more into unity consciousness, oneness, really seeing ourselves in the eyes of everyone else. 
it's not to get a fancy job or to have a hundred thousand followers on Instagram or, you know, whatever. Those are expressions. They're nice, but really the purpose is the evolution of the soul. And so if the IntelliKey of the soul is to evolve, it's going to keep bringing experiences in your life to try to get your attention to go wake up, heal this wound, let go of this pattern, break this generational pattern, um, you know, slip out of this way of being, this way of consciousness. So let's say, for example, you really have a hard time keeping a job or getting a job. It's just like the career has been really hard for you. Work has been really hard for you. You get a job and then the company goes through layoffs or you get a job and there's a misunderstanding and you're fired or you get a job and then like, you know, the, the company moves and you can't move, whatever. It's just like constantly, you just can't seem to hold on to a steady job. And you can, you have choices. You can go into victim consciousness and go, life just hates me. Things don't work out for me. Things are just hard. Blame it on the government, blame it on capitalism. Like you can blame it on all kinds of things. Or like you said, you can say, well, I'm the common denominator. But then you don't want to go from blaming outside of you to blaming yourself because we want to take responsibility, which if you break that word up, the ability to respond, right? Response ability. I get to choose how I respond without blaming and shaming yourself. So you look at, all right, I'm the common denominator in this. What is this reminding me of? What could I possibly be learning from this? Oh my gosh, it reminds me of all those times I tried out for the soccer team and I didn't make it, and my dad shamed me. Reminds me of all those times I studied really hard, and I wanted to get an A, but I only got a B plus, and my dad was so disappointed. Reminds me of all those times I liked somebody, and they didn't like me back, or whatever it may be. And when you can go, I felt this way before. When have I felt the sense of rejection, the sense of I'm doing something wrong, the sense of just disappointment and almost shame? Because if you think, if you're, you know, you can't hold a job or whatever the, the example is, you're going to feel a sense of shame and like you're doing something wrong. So you go back to that child who felt like he or she wasn't enough. And you start to first allow for the feelings because what happens as children is we know how to feel as children. If you've ever seen a child have a temper tantrum and they're left un uninterrupted, you know, they're left in a safe space just to have their tantrum, they'll go through the range of emotions, you know, getting to, up to rage. And then they'll come back down through sobbing, through sadness, through whimpering. And then they'll move into self-nurturing, like rocking themselves or picking up a stuffed animal. And then they'll be fine because the emotion moved all the way through them. But usually as children, we're not really given a safe space to feel. Often we don't feel safe in our home or we're over soothed. Like a lot of our parents were uncomfortable with our feelings. They were uncomfortable when we were sad. Or mad. So like, it's okay. It's okay. Come here. It's okay. Do you want some candy? Do you want to watch TV? It's okay. And it's like, oh, you know, even though it seems loving and nurturing because mom wants to rescue me, I start to learn feelings are bad. I'll just hold them inside. Or we're told, boys, don't cry. Don't be a baby. Children to be seen, not heard. And we're ashamed for our feelings. So all those feelings and emotions get lodged into our body. And that's the glue that holds the belief systems in place. So I love mindset work. I think it's great. Um, one of the reasons I went back and got my training and degrees in psychology in addition to life coaching is because one of my frustrations with coaching is it's so much about mindset. Just change your beliefs, change your beliefs, change your mind. But if they're glued to my emotions, if I don't deal with that emotional level and I don't deal with the past, good luck changing the beliefs below the surface of the water. If I really want to get to the subconscious, I've got to find those feelings that are glued to those beliefs, lodging them in place. So that belief of something's wrong with me, I'm not enough, it's lodged in with the feelings of shame, sadness, maybe anger, everything else. So when we go back and do that inner work and do that inner child work, first we give our inner child the permission not to relive their trauma. They don't have to go back to the soccer game where they weren't picked or you know, even worse, you know, a lot of people have lots of abuse and just chaos and horrific things that they live through, but they can go back to that child and be like, I'm here. What are you feeling? What do you need? And we give ourselves the, the space and the compassion to cry, to, to yell, to, to feel the feelings that we never got to feel. 
And then it's like, they start to kind of unglue from the beliefs. And then we can start to look at the beliefs and tell that child inside of us that you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. And you're so enough and you're so worthy and you're so deserving. And again, this kind of work, I'm kind of going through it very, very quickly, but this is the work I do with people over time. Mm -hmm. But this kind of work is, starts, is what unlodges it. And we forgive ourselves for buying into the misunderstanding that we're unworthy. And then the soul goes, ah, 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 she's getting it. Because on the soul level, we all know we're whole, complete, worthy, deserving. Like I'm no better than you. You're no less than me. It's just, we're enough just for merely existing and that's what the soul wants us to learn that's what our higher self higher consciousness evolution wants us to get is holy shit i'm totally okay just as i am so when we can go back and really get that let go of those feelings unlodge the unglue those beliefs that are continuing to subconsciously program what we're attracting then our external world starts to change make sense yeah, it makes sense. This is fascinating. Let me just let me just uh, feed it back to you to make sure I have it um, exactly, and then you can correct me. But so it sounds like what you're saying is we have these feelings. These feelings are attached to a memory, perhaps mm -hmm. from childhood, and out of that memory um, or whatever happened, there are patterns and or stories or habits that we adopt these compensatory mechanisms to mm -hmm. account for that. And so it sounds like what you're saying is the first step is the feelings guide us to the memory, which then guides us to the pattern. And it sounds like also what you're saying is, it's not necessarily that we need to relive this event. We just have to essentially go, what was I needing at that time? Exactly. And once I get to that point, if I start to, and it sounds like you're even, you even talk to yourself and coach yourself, yeah. like almost like I'm talking to little Jade in a sense. Yeah. And helping him, you know, sort of process some of these emotions. And then at that point, so if, if I'm correct there at that point, is that when we begin to finally begin to see, okay, now out of that, here are the compensatory patterns and things that I have done. And do yeah. we begin to then see why some of these things are repeating perhaps in we our romantic do. life or in our work life? We absolutely do. We're like, oh my gosh, I, totally think I'm not worthy, which is why I keep getting fired. And my unworthiness has made me extra try to prove myself by being a doormat, by being a people pleaser, by not speaking up because I'm so afraid to be rejected again. And so like, I, I am, I'm not really showing up as the best employee. Like think of it, just using that example I gave, if someone is coming in with super low self-worth, do you think they're really going to shine as an employee? No, because they're going to play it safe they're gonna play it super, super small. And so, you know, again, I drew that comparison of like not making the soccer team, it's the same feeling of like, I'm not enough, I did something wrong. And when you really can go back, like, and you summarized it beautifully and give your inner child, basically the parenting that they never got, right? And this is not to blame our parents, but most of our parents didn't do a lot of their deep work <laughs> before they had us. So you know, they're, they're triggered children, raising children. And when we really can be that parent to ourselves, that loving parent to ourselves, that's when things really start to change. And then we don't need the external triggers anymore. You know, we don't need the health issue. We don't need the struggles with money. We don't need the relationship pain. We don't need the constant fights with friends or neighbors or whatever it is. Like we, we learn and we evolve and we outgrow the, the triggers that were there to awaken us. This is fascinating, Christina. And you know, I, I know, I know that a lot of people, they, when they look to you, they always, they oftentimes talk like she is this amazing relationship coach. And, and what's really interesting to me is that you're focusing on the individual first, it seems, so that they can then come into um, this sort of relationship. So let me, let me, is that is that kind of what you're saying? Because I think most people would go, oh, Christine, let me talk to you about, you know, my lover or my husband I'm having difficult with, difficulty with or my wife or my significant other. And you're essentially going, OK, we'll get to that. It sounds like this is your work, but let's first work on what is going on with these patterns that you have been generating in the first place. 
Yeah, so e that's... exactly, exactly. No matter what somebody comes with it, whether it's job, money, health issue, like it's, 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 it's always about that, but it's never about that. It's never mm -hmm. about thing we think it's about. It's, it's usually yeah. the thing we think it's about is the trigger to get to what we really need to work on and see. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes me think, you know, when I was growing up, I had siblings, right? So I just want to share this with you. And you can coach me here if you want as well, just so people can see how you do it. But like, I my my oldest brother was the smart one, right? Th these are the stories I feel like I wrote. My oldest brother was the smart one. My second brother was the beautiful one. You know, he's just this gorgeous guy. My, my sister was the sister, right? She was the girl in the family and the caretaker and nurturer. So it left with me being the athlete, right? And also I, I took that persona on. Matter of fact, I took on the dumb jock persona and I took on the tough guy persona. And what's interesting is I did not realize that for a long time because I was living this persona and this story that was creating problems sort of in my life that kept coming up. And so it sounds like when I becoming aware of that, right, and then beginning to change that, like I remember... Um, I had this conversation with my dad. It was like, it, it seems like my senior year is like my, my father and a, and a teacher. It seemed like it happened in the first week, but you know how it's been a long time ago. So I don't know, yeah. it could have been months apart. But my dad basically told me, he goes, look, Jade, you're a fuck up. Like you're going to have to get your stuff together. And I really respected my father. So that was a big, you know, sort of thing to have my dad who I respected and admire point that out to me. And then I had a teacher tell me, look, if you even graduate from high school, um, you're going to be, a, you're going to, uh, you'll never go to college. You'll, you'll drop out of college, whatever. And what was interesting for me at that time is that a lot of kids would go, um, you know, internally and maybe feel embarrassed. Uh, you know, this teacher called me out in class. My personality type was like, uh, I'll show you, you don't know me. Right. But one of the things that it did do for me is it pointed out uh, to me um, some of what uh, I was struggling with. So here's my, my question for you, because um, this is what I oftentimes struggle. There are what people say about us, right? And there are what we think about ourselves. And sometimes those things, uh, you know, kind of match up, but sometimes they don't. And certainly in my life at times, there's been things that people have said to me that I'm like, that's actually accurate, even though it pisses me off or makes me sad or <laughs> makes me feel insecure. Yeah. And then there's other times where I'm like, no, it's not. Um, but it takes time, right? It takes these repeated patterns, for example, getting into uh, relationships with women and, they, and them essentially saying, you're not in touch with your emotions over and over and over and over again before I, I, I sort of wake up. And so the next stage of this, my question uh, for you is if I'm someone who is doing this, we've heard this idea of like, I can start thinking uh, different thoughts maybe, mm -hmm. but um, I also wonder about just living into a new story. Like, what if I just wake up and say, hey, Christine, I'm going to decide that I'm going to be the smart kid and a writer, and I want to write a book one day, and I'm going to live into that particular story, even if I don't necessarily know how. Mm -hmm. is, this, uh, is this a way um, that you see, or is there another way that you see to begin this process? Like, for example, if I want to, you know, have a normal uh, emotionally mature relationship with a beautiful, brilliant, you know, woman. I'm a cishet male, so that's kind of how I orient. But um, what, how do I have to then begin to show up? Like, what stories do I need to begin telling myself? And how do I begin to make those stories to get them in my brain so I really start showing up in the world that way? And is this even the way that you look at it? I'm just curious if you were coaching me and you were like, I, you've got some stories you need to rewrite, Jade, or some patterns you need to rewrite, and we've dealt with your inner child work, what is then the next step for me to go out and be this new person? Yeah. Well, if you have dealt with the inner child stuff, because that is a big burden to carry, you know, I, I take it by the order you were the youngest, by the order you told mm -hmm. that story. And yeah. um, there was a whole like, so one of the biggest wounds we get as children is not really feeling seen for who we truly are. And that's a biggie. It's a biggie. And it's one that can take decades to even realize we have because we morph into an identity that was often formed for us or that we think we needed to have, you know, and you might've loved being an athlete. And if you were just nurtured and loved and Jade, you can be whatever you want. And your parents were just curious about discovering who you were. 
you might not have chose that. Like, we don't know. There's only, there's only one way to, there's no way to know for sure. But that, that wound of not feeling really seen is going to perpetuate a pattern of not feeling safe. And like you said, needing to keep people at a distance. So you probably have an energetic of come here, go away, come here, go away. I want to get close, but go away. Red light, green light. And yeah. it can be very confusing, but that's the way that, that, that part of you is wanting to get control and wanting to feel safe because it, it's like, here's the thing with intimacy and relationships. My husband and I were just talking about this last night. The things we want the most are also, also the most terrifying. So we so want to be seen. All of us, we want to be seen, we want to be heard, we want to be held, and we want to be loved 100% for who we truly are. No mask, no personality, no compensatory strategies, like this is me, naked on all levels. And that's terrifying, terrifying, because the risk, like if I really let someone see me, like true intimacy, like totally raw, let somebody fully, fully in, the risk of rejection, the risk of loss, the risk of judgment goes way up. So we all have our ways that we red light, green light intimacy. So yes, we can live into a new story and say, this is what I want to be. But we have to kind of couple that with doing the inner work of, and what am I still scared of? <laughs> and what am I subconsciously pushing away? And in addition to living into the new story, we have to deal with that. We have to know the sneaky ways that that, that, that comes up, you know, that, that, that we're, for example, let's say that I'm just making this up. If avoidance is one of your things, um, there might be just little, little things that you notice you start to do. Like you start to all of a sudden notice that the way she chews her food is really annoying. And just start paying attention to just like little things that start to edge you back a little bit, right? And so we're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing that judgment thing. I'm starting to collect evidence for all the ways she's not attractive. That's my little boy getting scared. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. So we have to pay attention to the little ways that we start to push away, the patterns that we engage in that quote unquote, keep us safe, but block intimacy at the same time. So in around, I'm, the short answer to your question is yes, it's living into a new story. And it's also being so diligent and so aware of our operating systems and patterns and knowing when we're starting to slip into those things that we think keep us safe, but actually are the very things that are blocking us from what we truly deeply want. Yeah. And it sounds like what you're saying is that, you know, um, and this is a question, not a statement, but it sounds to me like you're saying perhaps these patterns, once we spot them, doesn't necessarily mean they go away, or, you know, and maybe maybe they they're still there. And it's just about choosing a different operating system. I oftentimes like think of it, it's like, you know, here's one thing we could play. We can hit, you know, play on this and we can hit play on this. We have a choice. And sometimes when we're stressed, you know, the brain takes a shortcut. So if we've been playing this this story for a long period of time, maybe that's the one we keep playing. So we have to be aware of that. So it sounds like you're saying these patterns may stay around and you have to be completely diligent so that you can say, oh, there it is. Let me push play on the yeah. new sort of way of being. Yeah. yeah. One, like it one, is one safe other for me to let someone in. It is safe for me to love. Like it is safe for me to be seen and like reassure those triggered parts that like you got them, like no matter what, you're going to be okay. Here, here's a difficult one, maybe, maybe not for you, but it's, it's always been a difficult one for me. So let's say I'm in a relationship or someone's in a relationship with somebody and they're, they're going through this sort of process and they, and they get it and they're just like, okay, well, instead of closing down and going back into old patterns, I'm going to love more. Maybe in fact, I'm going to open and you know, take two steps forward and love this person in the way that I want to be loved or you know even a higher evolution the way they want to be loved speaking of things like the the five love languages and things like that kind of the platinum rule but what then happens is that other person we can never truly control that other person and so then what happens is is we step into this new thing and they begin to do what they do in response to how we act then a new dynamic emerges and so i oftentimes wonder about how long 
do we stay in dynamics like this or should we stay in dynamics like this if when we step up and, and are kind of being our best next level selves in reaction to that, people continue, continue to see us a way we're not or a way we no longer wish to be. In other words, what, what happens when we get sucked into their patterns? Like sometimes people's wounds and patterns are so deep and entrenched that they, they were, all we're doing is really playing a role for them. It's almost like they auditioned us for this particular part and we're playing this part whether we like it or not. Is this something that you see? And how do you work sort of around this in relationships? Because it is something that I feel like I see a lot in a lot of people and they're trying to be this next best level person. And they're also engaged with somebody who may or may not be on board uh, for that. And so I'm just wondering how that manifests and if you have any coaching for us in that regard. Yeah, well, you can't be cast in a role that you're not qualified for. Hmm. So even if you think that it's kind of just them and you're just sucked in, it, it never is. We always have to take 100% responsibility for our 50% in any relationship. And there are times when we come into a relationship and we're kind of at the same level, like consciousness wise, how many wounds we've cleared, all that kind of stuff. And then one person, and I'm not going up in terms of a better than way, but just going up in terms of like a consciousness way. One person starts to lower the iceberg, the water, more of the subconscious is revealed, works on their stuff, has more of that inner, inner parent, and the other person stays where they are that's when you have started to have a mismatch. And that's one of those things that in my opinion, and when I coach people, unless this person is willing to start doing the work to come up and come into that frequency, come into that vibration that you're at, it doesn't work. Hmm. And so usually the decision of the person who has outgrown the relationship is to leave. And often that's the best thing you can do for the other person because it often is their catalyst to maybe do some of their work. But I have seen, and I've coached, I don't even know how many people at this point, I've been coaching people since 2004. So every topic there is. And I've in so many relationships and including my previous marriage, when it gets to the point where one person is willing to do the work and the other one isn't, the person that's willing to do the work either has to just totally be okay with that and accept, I love this person. You know, I take trips with them. We spend holidays together. We raise the kids together, but they're not really like my soul family. We're not going to have that consciousness connection. I'm really not going to get my deep, most intimate needs met. And, and you can totally be okay with that and maybe have friends and a community where you get that. Or you go, you know what? I want more. And you don't. And so this relationship has an expiration date. And those are hard conversations to have and very, very hard decisions to make, but it happens. It happens a lot. But what happens more frequently is that two people get into a relationship and they go through three stages. And I think I learned this from Gay Hendricks. First, there's infatuation attraction. We all love those phases where it's just like, oh my gosh, the sex is amazing and you lose weight and you can't wait to hear from the person again. And that goes on for a while. And then you go into the power struggle. And this is where both of you are vying for safety. Both of you are still vying for your identity. Both of you are still like, can I trust you? And you're kind of like subconsciously testing each other out. And there's this power struggle where a lot of the inner child wounding will come up and the attachment styles, you mentioned the avoidant attachment style. There's also anxious and disorganized. Um, those will come up and we'll just kind of be in this power struggle, power dynamic. And that's where a lot of couples bust. And I love it when couples come to me or to, to Steph and I in that phase, because that's where the juiciness is. Like if both people are willing to do the work, they don't have to be going at the same pace, but if they're both willing to do the work in terms of seeing what's triggering each other and like what's being triggered inside themselves through the relationship, that's where you can evolve from power struggle into love and into intimacy where you're actually no longer relating to each other from your past. You're actually creating the relationship from your vision and your values and where you want to go. And that's the relationships that really like go the distance and, and make the impacts and are, are peaceful for people because they've moved out of that power struggle. 
But remember, whenever we were in a relationship, <laughs> we chose to be there. Like we got there for a reason. And even though it may seem like it's all this other person, and if only they would just change, there's some dynamic we're invested in that's keeping us there. So it's really important to remember the old adage when you point finger at somebody, but three fingers pointing back at you. So again, not self-blame, but self-responsibility. I love that because I, I think it's certainly been something that I have uh, graduated to and evolved to in my own life, where it's like, if it's something that I want changed that's in my sphere of awareness, then it's up to me um, to change it. And it, I'll get what I essentially tolerate. I would be remiss having you here without asking you about, you know, what uh, a lot of people ask me about and um, everyone is interested in, but how do we then go about, you know, um, once we sort of get to this place where we're doing some of the work, and I, I think there's a lot of people who have, you know, done some of the inner child work, spotted their patterns, and now let's say they are single, and they're moving into this phase where they're like, I want to create this next level cherry on top, right? I mean, I, I, obviously, you don't need a romantic relationship to live a great life, but it is one of the most amazing, beautiful things about living life. And so when we want to get to that place and we feel we are ready, I can imagine that a lot of people um, go back and say, well, how should I be? Uh, instead of stepping forward and saying, here's how I am. It's the similar thing where people go, well, does this person like me instead of asking, do I like this person? So I guess what I'm asking is, how do you uh, believe we need to begin to orient after we've done a little bit of this work, and of course our work is never complete and romantic relationships are a great catalyst for more amazing work, but how would you advise people go about finding sort of this um, love relationship? I know you've been successful in it. You've helped countless people sort of uh, find their way through this sort of minefield. What sort of uh, insight and uh, tools and tips you, can you give us in this regard? So many. This is one of my favorite topics because after my divorce, um, I got divorced when I was about 31 years old and I, I really didn't want to get divorced again. <laughs> you know, like I really wanted to make sure that the next marriage I had was really um, everything that I wanted, you know, and not from my wounding, but from like my soul's yearning and who I truly, truly am. And it took me nearly a decade, about eight years before I met my, my now husband. Um, and there were, there were, I mean, this is something that we teach a whole program about, but I want to kind of break down some of the fundamentals. So there are a couple basically fundamentals. The first one was celibacy and being on my own, like not dating anyone and really cleaning up because the divorce triggered every breakup, every rejection, father wounds, all kinds of things. And, you know, I, it, it, rebound relationships are popular. Often people hear the best way to get over someone is get over some, under someone else. And that's just a Band-Aid. And it's, it's really going to prevent you from going deep enough into your grief and into your healing, even if you were the one who left. So a period of time where you're just with you. You're not on apps, you're not being set up, you're not, you're, you're not looking around for it. You're not secretly hoping, well, I'm so unattached, maybe someone will come in. You're really clear, you've got a do not disturb sign on energetically. And you just spend time healing your wounds, really truly getting to know yourself and becoming an all really great partner to yourself because newsflash for everybody, most of your partnerships, inner partnerships with yourself suck. Think of how you talk to yourself. Think of what you say to yourself when you look in the mirror. Think of what you do when you mess up. Like, would, you, would that be great in a partnership? <laughs> like if you talk to the love of your life in those ways, how long would they stick around? Mm -hmm. So mostly we're pretty shit to ourselves in, in so many ways. So we really got to look at how are we taking care of ourselves? How are we loving ourselves? How are we nurturing ourselves? How are we... Um, really like holding ourselves in a way that is not only attractive to someone else, but that we really enjoy. Like, do you really enjoy your own company? And I don't mean, oh yeah, I love being alone and watching Netflix and chilling like by myself. That's, that's alone time. That's different than do you really enjoy your own company? Do you make yourself laugh? Do you have compassion for yourself? Do you sit with yourself when you're triggered and allow your emotions to come up and say to yourself, it's okay. Like, it's okay to feel this. Like, I got me. You know, 
So that's the first step. And it, within that step, obviously, we're doing everything we've talked about in this call so far. The inner child work, cleaning up the wounds, looking at our attachment style, looking at why did I draw this person in? What, what lessons was I really learning from them? Like what, which of our issues do, dovetailed together? Like what was the true attraction here? So that you don't have to repeat those lessons. Cause I'm all for like, I don't want to do eighth grade again. Like I want to just move on to the next grade. And so that time of celibacy and really being on our own and not being at all energetically distracted by dating or someone else, that really gives us the time to do that. So that's the first step. A big a next step is then when we do decide to get out in the dating world, first, just make it fun. Like just have fun. No, because we can get so caught up, especially after a breakup in the list. And this is what I need. And these are my criteria. And this is what exactly I'm looking for. But it's so refreshing after we do that kind of inner work to just go out and be curious. Be like, who do I want to date? Do I want to date someone younger? Do I want to date someone older? Do I want to date a woman? Like, what, 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 what am I interested in? Like, let me be curious because it's really good after we've done all that, that clean out to be curious with boundaries, with boundaries. Like if you're someone that, you know, gets emotionally attached to anyone you have sex with, I'm not saying go out and sleep with hundred people. That's going to trigger you. Maybe don't even go out and sleep with one person. If you get emotionally attached, like know yourself but be curious. So it's that curiosity without boundaries, like really letting yourself explore, letting yourself, you know, if you are a very sexual person, but you were always shamed and maybe you grew up in a religious health household, let yourself run free. Like really let yourself just be whoever you want and experiment and don't get so caught up in this is what I'm looking for. Then after you feel like, okay, that was enough. <laughs> and I'm really ready for my person. I'm really ready for my person. A couple things to remember. You just are looking for one person. You know, when I would tell people what I was looking for in terms of how I wanted to feel in a relationship and the qualities and the values that were really important to me, people would say, you're asking for an awful lot. And I'd be like, well, I'm not asking for anything I'm not. So that's a big thing too. Like anything we're asking for, we've got to be. So say you want someone who's really confident. Are you confident? Say you want someone who's really adventurous. Are you adventurous? Say you want someone who's really successful. Are you successful in your own ways? Or are you looking for that person to be the things you're not? Yeah. So own who you are and be looking for your match, right? Not necessarily your equal, but your match. And remember, again, you're just looking for one. Not everybody has to like you. You're just looking for the one person. So when people would tell me my list was too long, I'm like, yeah, for 99.9% .9 of men, yeah. But I don't want all men. I want one. So that's a really good thing to, to keep in mind. And when we're thinking about what we want, pay less attention to qualities. Like he's this doll and he's from here and he's great with animals and blah, blah. Nah, doesn't matter. More about how you feel in the relationship. So I had a whole thing that I wrote out that was all about how I'd feel with my partner. Because it's feelings that draw things to us, not the list of qualities. It's a different level of manifestation. If you want really deep, true, lasting manifestation, let your emotions pull them towards you. That's what really pulls them towards you. I mean, that's the work of Joe Dispenza and many other people. Um, so write out everything you want to feel. Write it out in present tense and then record it in your phone because your own voice is so hypnotic. I mean, you listen to it all day long. So, and listen to it and just get in that feeling and get in that feeling and envision again, not necessarily a person, not necessarily specifics, but envision feeling that way in the relationship. And that's one of the ways you, you call it towards you. And then the final thing I'll say, cause I could go on and on and on for hours about this, but the final thing I'll say is then be super discerning. It's so the, um, life often gives us do-overs. So let's say that my last ex was, we'll use the emotionally unavailable example again. And usually there's a lot of attraction with emotionally unavailable people because what you miss emotionally, you make up for physically and sexually. So, and that was definitely a pattern of mine, being super attracted to emotionally unavailable, maybe slightly narcissistic guys, super charming, super fun. But in terms of like really going to the levels I wanted to go, not so much. And it was really my teenager that was picking these guys. My teenager who was rejected, never got the popular guys, never felt liked. And this charming, handsome guy would come and 
my teenager would be like, oh, this is so fun. But it, it would never get me where I wanted to go. So I had to be super discerning about what, what I was attracted to. So like I said, the universe will give us do-overs where we do all this healing and we're ready for our person and the universe will kind of go, let's see. Again, not to test us, but to continue to grow us. Let's see, let me just drop in one of your old temptations. Let me just drop in that super charismatic, charming, emotionally unavailable dude that you're super attracted to, that will give you anxiety, that you know, you'll be checking your phone every five minutes to see if he texts. Let's just drop one of those in and see what you do. And the universe did that to me <laughs> right before I met my husband. And I had to say, hell no. I had to feel it, see it coming, stick my toe in the pool just enough to get a little stung and go, oh, nope, that's it. Not playing this game anymore. I don't care how hot the chemistry is. No, 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 no. And so that's the discernment part. And that's when things really start to integrate is when we start saying no to the things that are not in alignment. We do not compromise we do not go, well, I could change that person or, well, this would be fun for a little bit. If we're really a stand for the kind of relationship we want, we say no to things a lot quicker. And that saying that no is again, what brings in the new, what brings in where we're headed versus where we've been, where we're bleh, versus where we've been. I'll tell you what, Christine, that might've been the best uh, sort of, um, narrative I have ever heard in terms of how to find your love. I mean, that's just absolutely brilliant and clear. I mean, thank you so much for that. It's like, well, I, I think that's, it, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, it really is just brilliant and super clear and lots of to do's. And I love that last part. Cause I also um, have had that thing and I'm, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm still single, but I still have that thing. I've kind of just got to this point where I'm like, ah, I think I'm going to, you know, get back into a relationship, but I also am very clear on um, what I will not tolerate. It's interesting that you, you talked about boundaries there because I think a lot of people miss that um, part of things. Right. I want to be respectful of your time. You are uh, just a brilliant, clear voice in this place, but um, any final thoughts you have for us, things that we really should be looking out for and where can we find you? How can people work with you? Um, how can they get in touch? Just give us uh, your sort of yeah. final thoughts and then how they, how they can work with you. Well, my final thought is two quick things. Number one, our superpower as humans is compassion for ourselves and for others. And I just want everybody to think about how they can be more compassionate with themselves and with others. Compassion, co means with, passion means suffering. Being with is suffering in any way. Compassion doesn't mean pushover. It doesn't mean pitying people. It doesn't mean going in and rescuing them. But how can you just be more understanding with yourself and others and be a little gentler on yourself? And also to remember that anything that's triggering you in the external world, and there's a lot, just turn on the news. I mean, I don't even have news, but turn on social media, scroll for five seconds, and you'll find something that will upset you, you know, or, or is likely to. And go, be curious, go, hmm, what is this reminding me of? What is this triggering? And use, instead of letting your external triggers and upset sort of just like rob you of the present moment and rob you of your emotional like sanctity and, and, and just put you on high stress alert, use the triggers and go, how can I use this trigger to heal something inside of me? Because that for me is how I find peace and contentment is when I'm upset by something outside of me Instead of just going down that train of blame and that and that and this and talking about it, I go, all right, what is this trigger? What is it reminding me of? What do I need to see? What do I need to own? And then I can get to, okay, got it. Shift it inside myself. And then that person or thing or whatever it is doesn't bother me anymore. Doesn't mean we just sit back and allow atrocities to happen and corruption to happen and all those kinds of things. But I truly believe we will all be more innovative and effective if we're not coming from a charged place. Mm. Again, that's the discernment again. It's like, I can come at an issue pissed as hell and mad and triggered. How clear am I going to be to make decisions and really come up with true innovation? Or I can come at it, come at it clear inside myself and go, this really needs to change. This is, this is not okay. Mm. And we don't, we can still have that, like, this is not okay energy, but we don't have that charge that's going to make us make emotional reactive decisions. 
Yeah, emotionally you know, decisions don't usually get us anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes me think of, uh, I don't know how much you, uh, I love Thoreau and have read, you know, I love all <laughs> philosophy, but um, Thoreau, uh, his civil disobedience, which is a popular work of his, one of the things I love about that particular work, it speaks to this, and I do think it speaks to relationships as well. It essentially says, violence is never really necessary. All that's really necessary is to simply stop contributing to what you hate. So you simply stop being involved in it. And it seems to go right to what you were essentially saying. It's like, you, you don't need to be mad or like crazy about it or you know violent in any way or anything like that. You just go, I will not tolerate this. I won't deal with it. And it's been a, it, that, that work was amazing for me in my personal development, but also in my personal um, relationships. So um, I just love, I love that thought, but it's funny that I didn't think we, it would tie into Thoreau, but it just made me think of that. Yeah, totally. So, so tell me um, how, I know you have a program coming out um, recently, I think, right? You got a program coming out uh, at some points in the next several weeks or months that people might be, be able to get involved with. And then I don't know if you're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, because I'm sure a lot of people after listening to this are going to want to connect with you. Yeah. So thank you for that. We have, um, so I got asked after I met my husband, I got asked by literally thousands of women, how did you find him? <laughs> what was your process? And I'm writing a book about it, but the thing that we decided to do is we teach a program called be the queen, which is a three month virtual program, um, that we teach live. So it's not, a, it's not recordings where we take women through the journey. Um, the, the exact same journey I went through in terms of really calling in, you know, my person, my, my mom always jokes with me because we've been together now three and a half years. And I usually have about a two year window with men, <laughs> like around two years, I'm, they're driving me crazy. I'm not attracted to them. It's like, it's like over <laughs> So we hit the two year mark. And my mom was like, wow, you're actually more into him now than you were in the beginning. I'm like, I know this is the one. Um, so we developed this program and it's great that we teach it together because women really love having stuff there. And like the, the, they're able to feel safe and they're able to really learn about men in a whole different way. Um, so that program starts end of November, beginning of December, and it's just christinehassler.com slash be the queen. And it's the last one we're teaching live for quite a while. So if you want to get in for the live one where you get live coaching from us, and it's a very rich program, not in terms of tons of material coming at you, but it's incredibly transformational. I just actually saw one of the queens from the first program and met her new baby that she had with her guy that she met like four months after the program. And we get lots oh, of wow. stories like that and wedding invitations and all kinds of stuff. So that's coming up. And then um, I don't do too much one-on-one -on -one coaching. I do a little bit. You can go to christinehaster.com, sign up for my coaching assessment, inquire there. But the other thing that I have is a coaching institute where I train coaches and that's um, elementumcoachinginstitute.com. So if you're an aspiring coach or coach that wants to get any better, um, then that's a really good resource as well. Yeah. And you're also on social and incredibly generous with, I mean, a lot of this stuff you all will learn that you, those of you listening will learn from Christine and Steph, her husband, they both do incredible education um, online as well, which oh, I'm grateful for. The biggest, my biggest contribution actually is my podcast where I coach mm -hmm. people live on air and yeah. then explain what I did. So if you want to hear inner child work in action, if you want to hear me coach someone on relationships, that's that's all free and that's called over it and on with it so that's a really yeah. good way to learn too yeah i know your podcast is hugely popular for a lot of people um christine thank you so much um i just have so much respect and admiration for you my friend and uh please send my love to steph as well and i hope to catch up with you guys both soon come to texas <laughs> yep absolutely talk to you soon